For those who are unaware, as uh, he mentioned, I am from Switzerland. And in Switzerland, the little known secret is that at birth, they surgically remove your sense of humor. So if any of my jokes fall particularly flat, just don't throw the tomatoes as yet. So apparently, I lured you here with the heading, the biggest sector you've never heard of. And you're probably thinking, well, what kind of an insult is that? You guys and girls are well-read, you're internet savvy, you're curious uh, animals, you are out there and about and you look at the world and you are interested in it. So how in the hell did you ever miss an entire sector of the economy? How is that even possible? What the hell is York talking about? Well, I have made assumptions, of course, but it may be just that you have seen a little snapshot of this incredible sector. You might have seen one part of a very kilometer long train in between the trees. So you might have seen snapshot of this little beast, but you haven't seen the whole picture. And to give you an idea of how big it is, let me or try to picture as if there was an ocean, a sea of entrepreneurial opportunity. Imagine the sector as an ocean. And on this ocean, just the Africa part has 800,000 to 1.2 million businesses in it, vessels. Call them little ships, from the handmade little canoe right down to the fishing vessel, to the ocean liner, to the container ship, to whatever else that you find out there. But in these vessels are phenomenal. They have their staff by very professional people. You've got engineers, you've got operators, you've got the engine room, the navigator. These are people who studied long and hard and are really, really good. Sometimes slightly less good, sometimes brilliant, but they are professionals. And yet, all of these ships, or almost all of these ships, lack an entrepreneurial captain at the helm of it. So 1.2 million ships out there waiting for entrepreneurs to put their hand up and go and make businesses out of these little adventures. So what the hell is this thing? Well, what if I told you that uh, President Obama and a number of ministers around the world are risking their reputation, their political career, they place in the history books just to try and give it a shot at making the sector work? How cool is that? And the sector is not just measured in financial returns but it's measured also in terms of impact on human life. I cannot think of a better sector to be involved in than that little thing called primary health care. Now, you may or may not actually have passed by the term. It may have been thrown here and there through NGOs and government agencies. So today, let me just give you a little insight into this amazing beast out there. If you imagine a pyramid, at the top you've got the hospitals. They're the usual things that you know of. Just below that you've got the specialists, ear, throat, nose surgeons and all that. Rhinoplasty in my case. <laughs> then you've got the doctors, the GPs. And that's what people normally know about healthcare. That's usually when they say, you know, let's go, to, let's go to the doctor or to the hospital. And it doesn't matter who pays for it, whether you pay it out of your own pockets or the medical aid, or the government, it's a very expensive and non-sustainable way of delivering health care. So Aaron Mozzaledi, the Minister of Health in South Africa, is now trying to say, listen, stop it, don't go there. I want you to go to a nurse-based environment. And that little cut that you had this morning, have a nurse look at it, clean the wound, put the plaster, send you home, or refer you upward at a fraction of the price. But how big is this thing? Well, how many of you have been to pharmacies? I presume quite a number of you. And when you stand in front of a pharmacy and you look to your right and there's a little room with a desk, a chair, a rusty or no, rather a young and brand new bed and a rusty nurse. <laughs> I have a contract on my head by the nurse association. That's typical primary health care. If you think of retirement villages with frail care, over 2,000 in South Africa alone, 4,800 primary health care centers, step-down subacute centers, which is like a bed and breakfast with nurses. So step down from a hospital. You've got occupational health care, which is really the clinics in the factories, in the mine, on the oil rigs, on construction side. You've got independent private practitioner nurses. You've got the caregivers. Can you get a sense of how big this industry is? But there's a problem. They've been trained in health care. They haven't been trained 
in running a business. And these businesses that they are involved, these clinics are complex beasts. If you take a step-down clinic, 200 beds, lots of patients, lot of organization, as you walk in, there's a reception, there's administration, there's an HR component, there's a stock room, there's a medicine room, there is a nursing station and a clinic, there's a point of sale for the restaurants or the catering, there's a maintenance and all of these parts. They are, these are run by nurses who are doing a phenomenal good job, who've got hearts bigger than, than my head. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is an unbelievable opportunity for entrepreneurs to step up and to come into something that for the next 10 to 15 years is going to provide incredible opportunities for all of us, not just to make a financial return, but also to bring efficiencies into the business and to make a difference in people's lives. Because when you run something better, you waste less money and you waste less resources on administration, just for an example. So how do you get into this? I don't know, I don't have a formula for you. I can tell you maybe just very briefly my story, how I got into it, and maybe that will apply to you and how, not just maybe in primary healthcare, but in any business that you're thinking of going into. So as he mentioned, I'm from Switzerland. I worked all over the world. One day I find myself at Goldman Sachs in London, doing deal after deal after deal, and actually not making an impact in anybody's life. So I have two pieces of paper on my desk. That was 2007. The one is The Economist, which says Africa, the hopeless continent. And usually when a magazine says that, I get very excited because I'd like to prove I'm wrong. On the other one was a report by Jim O'Neill, who the founder of a term, who coined the term BRICS, who said, listen, Africa is the next place to be. People in Africa, just like in a relationship, after a while you take for granted your partner. You take for granted the amazing potential that you have here. So you were a little bit sleepy at the time. You were not yet ready to embrace this enormous beast that is out there to be grabbed and to be made better and improved and for creating jobs and businesses and so forth. So I packed my bags, came here, and of course, I'm an ex-banker, so I know everything. I started six businesses, five failed within nine months. And the reason they failed is that I came up with ideas and products and I wanted to sell them, which is great in the textbooks. But what I had forgotten to do is to sit down over a nice coffee and actually meet the people who are already working in the different industries, to actually get to know them to break away this, hi, I'm here to buy your business, I'd like to invest, let's do a due diligence. I know this is not going to build a great report between us, but let me really ask tough questions that really embarrass you. Because, you know, in a startup you have all the answers and your books are perfectly clean and so forth. <laughs> so that's why the coffee is so important. Now, if you, uh, if you can't handle too many coffees a day, I will forgive you if you go drink decaffeinated. I have yet to find a space in my heart for tea drinkers, but one day I hope it will come to that. But drink a nice cup of coffee, get to know people. So I started meeting different people in the different businesses, and this is healthcare. It is such a huge industry, and yet completely fragmented. People are not working together, which is why if you start collaborating and working together, there's such potential. And when you start working together, and the client appreciates it because now he doesn't have to go to eight people, he can go to one person who does all the eight people's job. You make a difference also in the client's life and that can lead to profitability and sustainability. So in the long run, I invite you tomorrow, when you get out of bed with a cup of coffee or two, to go out there and find new opportunities where you can put your entrepreneurial hunger, your business acumen, your passion, and to try and match it and find people who are actually doing good and see if together you can't improve the world and leave it in a better place than we found it. Thank you very much for your time. <laughs>